Okay, we'll start recording. Oh, okay, so hopefully, hopefully everything is recording now. Um, yeah, so I'll go through a quick overview of this class, uh, and then we'll jump right into um, the lecture for today. Okay, so we'll go over some class logistics. Uh, so you guys are here in this room, so that means you've made it. You figured out that our location is Physics Building 140, and we're meeting Mondays and Wednesdays, 2.10 to 4 p.m. Um, our office hours haven't been decided yet. If you saw on Canvas, Alan sent out a poll. Please fill it out. We'll set office hours um, using that information. And you can contact us through Canvas or email Alan. I'll also put my email somewhere. So lectures will not be hybrid. Um, that means no remote attendance, but they will be recorded and posted on Canvas. So that if you miss a lecture, you can uh, watch them, watch the recordings and stay up to date. So this is copied straight from the syllabus. It's really tiny font, so you don't need to look at it right now. But basically our first three lectures will be an introduction to R. Um, so I'll be teaching this week, Monday and Wednesday, and then Alan will be back next Monday. And that's also when the first homework will be assigned. So homework is a pretty big part of the course. There, it's gonna be worth half of the final grade and there will be four assignments. Alan has a very strict schedule. Um, so you'll have enough time to work on each one. There'll be a 5% deduction per day for each day slate unless you have a doctor's note. And uh, for the homework, you have to submit these three things. Uh, don't worry if these don't mean anything to you right now. We'll talk about it. Um, but basically, please submit something that's a PDF file, and then please submit code that I can run. That's the gist of it. There, there will also be a final project for the class, um, and that's worth 30% of the final grade. There's a nice outline. Alan will talk more about this next week. Okay, right, that's it for the slides. Um, now let's go to the meat of the class. So I hope you all downloaded R Studio and R. Please, uh, please open it up if you do have it. If you don't have it, pretend like you have it. <laughs> Look on with us with a neighbor if you don't have it. Um, just want to know how, how many of you have worked in R before? Okay, so you guys might find this a little bit redundant. Um, this is going to be a refresher, uh, but maybe you'll learn something new from it. So don't check out completely. So if you've worked in R before, you might be familiar with R Studio um, and this interface. So there's four parts of the interface. There's um, the editor at this top left over here. This is kind of, this is like a notebook. Um, this is where you write the script and code. You can run code either line by line, you highlight it and you press run, or you can run the whole script you're looking at by pressing source. The, this, this window over here is the console. Uh, it's also called, there's also a terminal. So um, console is kind of where you can see output printed. So if you, for example, run a function that says print, you'll see it printed out over here. Run some evaluation, like some function that you want evaluated, it'll be printed out over here. This window is has the environment slash history. Um, so that is where you'll see all your global variables in the environment. Um, and we'll see more when we start working with code. Um, and this window has like a file explorer. It'll have plots when you start making those. Um, a bunch of other things, which will probably make more sense once we start writing code. Anyone have any questions? Please feel free to like raise your hand as we go along in case something isn't clear. Okay, so everyone, I want you to open up our studio, right? Do you have a script open? Okay. Do you guys 
know about working directories? Okay, so a working directory is basically the where our studio thinks its home base is. So if you look at my working directory, right now it's in my documents folder. Um, each one of you will probably have a different working directory. Um, if you see this, you'll you'll see how this is kind of inconvenient to work with. If I write a script and it's referenced to my documents, my working, my documents folder, it may not necessarily work if I give it to you. Um, so how many of you are familiar with our projects? Can I get a show of hands if you're not familiar with our project files? Okay, perfect, okay. So I want you to look at the top right of your RStudio screen. screen. You see, mine says project none. Do, does your screen say that? Okay, perfect. You don't wanna be working in this for, in the, for the purposes of this class. I always want you to make a project, an R project file. Um, and that's because it'll be easy for me to run code run your code if there's a problem. So first we're gonna start by um, going to file and hitting new project. So this is going to set up an R project file that'll neatly package all the stuff, all the code you're working on. Um, so I'm gonna use an existing directory. So in this case, a directory means a, a folder. Um, if I suggest that you make a new directory, something that says TTP to a what, maybe even lecture one. So I'm gonna find my similar folder. And then I'll hit create project. So I want you to notice that now um, the project is lecture one. So that's actually the name of the folder that I have saved um, for this for this class. Um, so when you create, if you hit new directory, you'll type in the name of a new folder that would be created. Um, and so save it somewhere nice so that you know where it is and call it something that makes sense. Everyone at this step. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is open up a new R script file. So please go to file again, and then we can hit. Okay, so you can hit file. Actually, I'll show you another way. You can also hit this button over here. We'll drop that arrow and hit R script. So this kind of file will have um, an extension. So that's um, the part after the name of the file that that will say dot r, um, and that's an r, it'll be an r script file. Has everyone been able to open that? Okay, sorry, I need to I need to take this down for a second. <laughs> Creating the full the project. Close one of my files. <laughs> so we're back. Okay, so this part might be um, pretty basic, but we're gonna go through some simple commands um, and objects. Oh, I wanted to tell you something. There's another way that you can change. Okay, so if you notice now, after I made um, after I made the project file, my working directory has now changed. Now it um, now our studio knows that it should be in this lecture one folder instead of my documents. Um. So that's what I like about our project file. It sets your working directory, WD, 
it, but it's not, it's more, it, it'll work. Um, you'll be able to package this lecture file, like, like this folder you've made uh, and send it to someone else and they'll be able to run code. There's another way that you can set your working directory if you hadn't done that. Um, I'll show it to you, but I don't want you doing this when you submit code for this class. So you can use the file explorer to like pick another folder. So I could go into lecture two. If I click this little gear over here and say set as working directory, then it would change um it would change my working directory. So now if I hit get WD, it says lecture two. But I don't want to do that, so I'll go back. There's also a way to do it um, in the code. That's the function set wd, but you'll have to type out the whole name of your file, the whole file path. Okay. So now that we know, now that we're sure we know what folder we're working in, uh, let's go into building some R code. So there's a bunch of basic operations you can do with R. Um, you can do a lot of, you can do all the basic math you need to. One plus one, I mean, one plus two. You see over here, it evaluates the three in the bottom. Oh, man. We can do uh, multiplication. You see in the bottom right, the okay. bottom left, it says six. Um, you can do exponentials. You know, you guys, everyone following along? Okay. Um, you can also set up, you can also store um, data as objects. Basically, you can create variables. So um, if you're unfamiliar with this, in R, the assignment um, operator is this arrow. Um, it's two parts. It's a lesson sign, and then it's a dash. So when you execute this code, um, you'll see that a new variable has been created in the global environment. And it's called x, and it has a value of 2. This is also. Um, like a legal way to set a variable. Let me give it a different number so you can see I'm changing it. Now, if you notice x is equal to four instead of two, I'm gonna use the equal sign instead of this arrow operator. I'm not sure why, but most time when I see code, it has the arrow operator in R. You can create multiple variables. So I'm going to rerun this this code. So it's um, x is equal to 2. So if you want to run one line of code, you can do control, enter. I'm on a PC, search command, enter on a Mac. Um, and that'll run one line of code. Let's change this back to And let's uh, set up a new variable called y. So if you want to run multiple, if you want to run multiple lines of code, you can highlight and do control enter, or you can highlight and hit run. You notice each time you run code, it shows up in the console. Um, these are assignment. These are just assignments, so there's no output printed. Now in our global environment, we have two new variables, x and y. I'm going to pause for a moment. Does anyone have any questions? OK. So the way R works, yeah, go ahead. You don't want it to print to the console. I don't know how to help you. It, it always prints the function in the console. But this isn't just meant for yourself. So you can always clean it at any point. And there's nothing there. Um, if you want to print the output, output to the console, you can just type the, vari uh, the variable you've entered. So the command. Like the code you run is the name of the variable and then it prints the uh, value of the variable. You can do the same for y. You can do the same for x plus y.
And if you update um, one of the variables, like if you update x, to three, and then if you run this again, I'll, I'll, run it. I'll click on this line and run it. If you run it again after that, um, you'll see that the new answer is six, means x has been updated to three. Yes. The start operator? The arrow? Yeah, I don't remember that. <laughs> I've been typing it out. I there is one. Okay. Thank you. I was just thinking that I forgot that. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Like like this, like how it's x yeah, equals yeah. two. I I've been I'm not quite sure. I know that the, it works. I think there's like a slightly different meaning, but I'm not sure. Um, I'm, I think it's fine if you use equals. I in most in most code that I see online, stylistically, they're using the arrow. Yeah, there might be a slight meaning. I'll look into it and get back. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so most of you guys are here for data analysis, I believe. So we'll go into, um, we'll start going into vectors and lists. So one thing that's pretty useful is this concatenate function. And that's, um, called by this letter C. For example, you can use this to make a list of numbers. Oh no. There we go. So by using C and then these parentheses, um, put in the numbers I want and make a list of these numbers. So using this function, you can create some vectors. Like, and you can call them something like x1, and x2. Maybe we can call it one x3. So running these three lines of code, I've created three new objects. Um, and each one, so this tells you that it's a numeric type object of, of length two from one to two. This one's from one to three, and it lists out the numbers over here. So to do operations with vectors, you can treat them just like we treated x and y over here. You can do one minus the other. Okay. Can anyone tell me why it's giving me zero, zero? What is the operation that they're performing? Say it again. Yeah, it's not quite a matrix. Um, it's basically, it's taking the first element, subtracting of, of the first object, and then doing, subtracting the first element of the second object from it. Same like same with that. Okay, here's the tricky one. If I do x three minus x two, uh, what do you think will happen? Say it again. Yeah, the length is different, so it should throw an error, right? So let's see what happens. Okay, it did throw a warning. Um, it said what you said. The uh, there's different lengths. But look at what it did before it threw the warning. What do you think is happening over here? Okay. 
yeah. So, so how did it get this too? Which way did it stretch it? Right, exactly. Um, so it took the longer object, um, or it took the shorter object, and it repeated it until it got a length that's equal to the longer object. So it did uh, 1 minus 1, 2 minus 2, and then 3 minus 1. So it's a little bit unexpected, and this is something you should be aware of when you're working in R is why uh, I believe Alan included it in the lecture. Um, it also works the other way around. If I did x2 minus x3, it still repeated x2 until it was the same length as x3. This time it was minus 2. It still threw the same warning. I'm going to take a moment to stop. Any any questions? Okay. We can do some more functions. We can multiply. We can multiply these vectors. Um, so although this might look like matrix multiplication, it's not exactly what it's doing. Um, so it ends up just multiplying each element, each object element wise. So it did one times one, then it did two times two, which is four. Does anyone know what the answer would be if this was multiplied as a matrix? Five. Yes, it should be five if we will multiply it as a matrix. Um, so I can show you real quickly how we would do matrix multiplication with these same vectors. Um, so the symbol you would use is this weird percent multiplication. So it's a multiplication symbol wrapped in percent signs. And that would get you five. So I, I know this might be like a little bit far in your memory, but um, the way matrix multiplication works is um, let me do a quick expel of this. So what it does is it um, treats the first vector as a row vector, and this one as a column vector. Multiplies it. It does uh, one times one plus two times two. So you uh, multiply. Um, like you, you do a dot product basically of the rows of the first matrix and the columns of the second and you add them, or that's what dot product is, you multiply and add. Okay, so that's matrix multiplication. Um, this is an element-wise multiplication option. So you can also um, multiply things that aren't the same length here as well. And it does the same thing. Did it do the same thing? Oh no. I meant to make this x2. So these aren't the same length. So it throws a warning again. Um, and it repeats the shorter one until it's three elements long. And you can do element wise. Um, division. One last thing, you can just multiply a vector by some scalar number and get you, um, and so it multiplies the same scalar, so in this case four, to each element of the list. So like I said earlier, this is matrix multiplication. Um, you can also do some other matrix functions. One thing you can do is take the transpose of a vector. So this, um, 
Actually, this might not be transposed. Let's let's forget about this for now. I'll come back and talk about it next tomorrow. Or on Wednesday. Okay. So so far, um, we've just talked about objects, um, but there's something else you'll encounter, and that's functions. So technically, um, the C that we were using earlier is a function, although it's like super useful. So we wanted to introduce that pretty early on. Um, there are many functions that you can use. There's like help. Um, you can type in another function into here, get help on it. Let's talk about ls. If we run ls, we can see all of the variables in our um, environment. If we run the function rm, we can remove an L, a variable from, we can remove a variable from our environment. So if we do rm y, so I want you to notice y is still in our global environment. Once I run this function, y is gone. And there's a lot of other things we can do. One thing that's helpful is this mean function. So we do mean of x3. You notice x3 is 1, 2, 3. We'll get 2. OK. Um, for list, we can do this length function and get how long it is back. So the length is three. We can do max. Do any questions, comments, concerns? Okay. He is transport. Let me put it back in there. Okay, so this is, a, I'm going to talk about the sample function now. Um, this is going to be pretty useful um, for your homeworks. So keep in mind, you should use it. Um, so the sample function will, uh, it has three inputs. The first, there's, um, an, there's an object X, um, from which you will sample numbers from. So think of that as like, uh, like for example, if you have an object that is 10, el 10 elements long, it's like a hat with 10 numbers in it. So we're gonna reach into this hat and we're gonna pick numbers at, or pick numbers at random. Um, the number of times you wanna reach into this hat and pick numbers is what N is. And um, replace is whether after picking a number, we're going to put it back in the hat. So it has another chance of being called. So these are, uh, so each one of this is an argument um, for the function. And the uh, position of, of the argument is, is pretty important. Um, if you put things out of order, you can still do that as long as you uh, call out what you're, what you're saying. So for example, um, so first let's, Let's take x3, maybe. x3, let's sample from it two times. And then let's say we do want to replace after we sample. So I will run this. So it found two twice. Let's do it again. This time it found one uh, each time. So I can keep running this. And each time I will get a different random number. Okay, I can, instead of just sampling twice, I can sample 50 times. And I get a random assortment of ones, twos, and threes. Um, let's say we like to have things, things be random, but let's say um, you want to be able to reproduce the randomness. Um, nothing in computer science is truly random. There's always something, some kind of pattern. So what we do is we can do, set seed 
and you just put a random number in here. Well, it should be a number. Let's try that again. Some random string of numbers. Man. Okay, let's make it shorter. Okay, now if I run the same, these two lines of code like multiple times, I will always get the same string of numbers. At first, um, let's say I run this and then I run this twice. So I got, I got the same string of numbers I kept getting. Let me run it again. I have a different string. Um, what I mean by reproducibility is that every time now I run this seed and run this twice, I will get this set of numbers. I hope that makes sense. It's a little hard for me to articulate that. So please ask questions if it doesn't make sense. Okay, so I want to try something. What happens if I set the replace to false? What do you think will happen? Can I get any, get any answers from the crowd? Bailey, Claire, yeah. Exactly. It's gonna it should throw an error. Let's see. Yes. It can't take a sample larger than the population. Okay, so if you want to set replace equal to false, you'll have to make sure your n is less than um, the population you're throwing in. Um I wanna just use this function to illustrate one more idea. So you can add objects out of order. So let's say I, I put x3 in here, but I want I put replace equals false. And then I put n equals two. This should also work. Oh, it didn't work. Maybe this doesn't work. I'll get back to you guys on this. Uh, let's move on. Has to be, I, okay. Okay. Some functions it doesn't have to be in order for, but I don't know which ones. <laughs> um, one more thing I want to show you guys while we're here. So there's a pretty easy notation to create um, like a numbered vector. Uh, so we can do, use the colon to, to get a sequence of numbers, sorry. So this will get you a sequence of numbers from one to 50. Um, so if I wrote a function, if I wrote code like this, sample one through a hundred, make, I want to have five random numbers, but I don't want to replace them. This is how I would do that. So this um, grab five random numbers from the numbers from one through a hundred without giving me repeats. So that's that's how you would write code like this. If you want a sequence of numbers that kind maybe maybe you only want even numbers, or you want to skip in some other way, um, you can do something like this. Actually. Right, so the first number gives is the number you start at. The second number is the number you want to stop at. And this is how much you want to go by. So this can be an integer. It can also be, um, it doesn't have to be an integer. Yeah. Say again? Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Good. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I see. I see. Yeah. So, what's happening here, you have to make sure you use the correct name for the input you're replacing. I thought it was N because that's what I had written here, but that wasn't correct. I have equals to. Perfect. Okay. 
So sequence is another function, um, just like sample is a function. There are functions that also let you repeat um, objects or sequences. So for example, if I want to repeat this sequence, five times, um, this is how you'd write it. So it re re repeats this object, which is the vector four, three, two, one, five times. This also illustrates that you can um, get sequences backwards. I'm going to move these up to the function section. This one, yes. Yeah, because I told it to do it in increments of 0.5, it gives me a decimal. Okay. Um, one more thing. Okay, let's take, so let's say we have a random sequence of numbers and we want to see how many unique numbers we have. Um, so first, I'm just going to show you what, you, what something is that you might look at. So you might find um, a sequence that, I don't know, from one to a hundred. Um, but, but it can have repeats. So this function um, set a variable called variable called z equal to a vector that's 40 to 40 um, yeah 40 long and has random numbers between one to 100. But how many of them are unique? Let's see. You can use this unique function to get all the unique numbers. This one looks pretty close to 40. Oh, okay. So. 30. This one has 31 unique numbers, uh, even though, oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so the set speed, um, okay. It basically just makes, if, if you want to have reproducible code to send, give to someone else, then you would want to set the seed. Um, and that's just so that when they run it, they will get like the same exact number that you are. And that's later on, we'll do some stuff. We'll do things where we want to take a data set. We want to randomly select rows and then use part of the data set for as a test and part of it as, um, develop a model so that's that's how you that's where you would use it uh i would say don't worry about it for now yeah i just wanted to introduce this to you guys early on um but for right now don't you don't have to worry about it okay there's some other interesting things we can do with z so we could run the summary function That gives us some nice statistics. So the median value we have is 48. That's good because you would expect um, if we sample randomly from one to 100, like the median and the mean to be 50. And only our first quarter value is close to 25 and our third quarter is close to 75. So cool. Yeah, no.
Yes, yes, exactly. That's a good point. I saw a question over here. I saw a hand, I thought. Okay. Okay, I'm going through this material pretty, pretty quickly, so please feel free to ask questions. Um, especially if R, if it's your first time using R, um, please make sure to speak up so we'll see any, like I can address anything, any questions you have. Oh, yeah, here. SDR is a string function. It's one of the built in functions. Um, we'll use it later. Let's work with numbers for the moment. Okay. So if there's a common fun, if there's like a kind of operation you want to do um, and you can't seem to find it, chances are um, someone has built a package somewhere to do what you want to do. So you should, um, you know, look look for packages first before trying to build your own function. Thing. So we will, I'll go into how to build custom functions next, but um, let's take a little detour to get some packages loaded. So has anyone ever heard of Tidyverse before or Dplyr? Cool. So um, let's take a moment to install a few packages. Um, so if you haven't used R before, you'll pro or if you've newly downloaded it, the um, this function called install packages is how you would get a new something downloaded. Um, so one thing that's really helpful is this pack package called dplyr. So like this, it's pretty weird. So I recommend installing that one. And another package called data.table. Um, have you, who hasn't, who doesn't have these installed on their machine right now? Or who is working on getting them installed? Yeah, yeah I'm not sure. I think I installed them once, but I just updated it yesterday and didn't make me reinstall them. So I'm very confused. Oh yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so you can go to packages and search for one. I just do library and see if it throws an error. So you know library ggplot. Do I have it? I don't have a package called ggplot. That's weird. Okay, so let's look at how you build a real um your own function. So a function has um. So this is like I'm gonna go over the anatomy of function. So you name you give your function a cool name. Hopefully something that reflects its purpose. Um, and to initiate a function, you type the word function, do parentheses, um, and you put um, anything that you need as an input to the function within the parentheses. So this is optional. Um, but I mean, if you're if you want to write a function that takes in a value, changes it, and then returns another value. Or multiple values, then you'd need you'd need to have an input, and then you use these curly brackets, um, and this is where you would actually write the function. So you would do some cool, I don't know, do some cool uh, code here, 
and then you would return um, some output. So this is the structure of a function. So let's uh, write some a simple one. Let's assume let's assume that our input is some kind of vector. Um, so if we sum the elements of the vector, oh, I forgot to show you this, I think. So one other cool thing you can do is you can run code directly in the console. So um, you can also sum the elements of a vector. So when I do sum x3, it returns six. That's because it's doing one plus two plus three. If I ask it to sum z, it should give me some really large number. There you go, 2001. Okay, so in this function, let's first sum uh, each element of the vector that we're putting in. Um, just for the heck of it, let's calculate the length of the vector. And then let's return um, x divided by y. No x divided by y. Okay, so you guys, what if I return z, so sorry, this is z, what is that value? Um, like, not, don't give me a number, but give me the meaning behind this value. The average, exactly. So since it's giving me the average, let's write, let's give, the name, we get to give it a bit, bit better name. I can't take credit for this name. This is Alan's name. <laughs> okay, so if I run, oh yeah. So I what I did here is I just clicked in somewhere on this line and then I hit enter and that executed this whole chunk of code. I want you guys to try something. Click somewhere in the function and then hit enter. Yeah, it throws an error. It's because it's trying to run whatever specific line you clicked on. So you always wanna make sure that you either highlight this whole thing and then run it or run it from the first line. Okay, the moment I ran this function, uh, you can see over here in the top right, there's a new function in the global environment and it has the name you gave it. Okay. I'm gonna pause now. Let's let's get some questions from the audience. <laughs> any any thoughts? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Um, yes. So if you had a function, you wanted to give it more than one input, um, you would just give each one a different name. You can call this input one, input two. Um, you, can, you also can give it different names. Um, you can call this like input vector input dot, I don't know, number. Do you have a specific thought in mind that you wanted to do? Like uh, a use case you were thinking of? Mm -hmm. Okay. So 
So there is a built-in function for this, but we can also write our own one. So like, let's say we wanted to give it two numbers. Um, you can also write, um, okay, yeah, you can use different um, functions you can use if else statements uh, to do this. So you could do if input Actually, I'm going to hold off on it. One thing. Okay. You guys heard of if else statements? Okay. Yeah, we expect people to come into this class with mixed backgrounds in programming, but it, just like other programming languages, we can do um, different, we can do if else statements, for loops, and while loops. Um, in class, in, in R. I don't even want to get to this in Selector 2, but I feel like we could get into this now. Yeah. So let's just go, we'll, we'll just use if for, for right now. Um, So the way if else statements work are if um, a condition in the parentheses next to your if statement evaluates to true, it will do one condition. It, it will execute some line of code. Um, if it evaluates to false, it will execute a different line. So in this case, we want to say see if input one or input two is larger. So if input one is larger than input two, we'd want it to return input one, right? Um, so we can do use simple um logic statements. And so if input one is greater than input two, return we can also do, yes, let's do else. We can also have it print some kind of statement um, to the console. Let's say we want it to say um, something like the largest number is this. So the print function lets you print um, text to the console. Um, text in R is given by double quotations or single quotations. So this function should print uh, this sentence. This is the largest number. And then um, it'll execute this little routine. So if input one is larger than input two, then it'll return input one. Otherwise, it'll return input two. Um, does, you, does anyone see any problems with this code as I've written it? Go ahead. Yes, yes, exactly. 
Okay, so we can definitely do that. Um, and R does support else if. We can do else if. So if um, they're equal to each other, we don't want this function to return a number um, because that would be incorrect. So it would be better if it returned a null value. So in R, the null value is NA. Um, so NA is kind of like the overarching value, but the overarching null value, but you can also specify um, NAs with different data types. Okay. So we haven't talked, in, talked about this yet. Let's do a little detour into data types. Um, have, if for those of you who are familiar with data types, what are some that you've heard of before that you would expect to find in R? Go ahead. Yes, characters. Um, so even though we call them characters, um, even though we call them characters, it doesn't have to be just like one letter um, characters. Can be include strings, um, which is basically letters concatenated to each other. So you can also store variables. Um, you can also create strings and characters and store them in R. Let's call. Let's make a variable called message. Okay. The way you um, initiate, the way you indicate um, strings and characters is with double quotes. You can also do single quotes. And there's no difference. Let's let's try get rid of that one. <laughs> okay, so um characters are one data type, so let's call this a character. Um there's also numeric data types, which we've been um dealing with so far. Um and that's like our variables x, x1, x2, etc. So one interesting function to tell you whether a data of whether an object is numeric is the thing that says is numeric. <laughs> so we throw in um, x1 into here, it'll return true because x1 only has numbers. Um, but if we do message, it should return false. Um, there's also integers. And the way you signify those are with these L's. So if I make a Y, let's do K. If we do a K that is equal to one L, um, if we run as integer on it, it should return true. Um, so we also have just like one, twos, and threes on the other ones, like x1. Let's see if that returns um, true or false. Uh, Oh, sorry. I meant to say is integer. Okay, right. So if we do k, um, and then if we do is integer, it returns true. But if we do is integer here, it returns false. Um, so this is an interesting thing about R. If you create a variable um, and set it to a number, it doesn't assume that it's an integer, even if you only give it an integer value. Um, it actually assumes that it's a double, I believe. 
and that a double just means that um, instead of being one or two, it can be 1.3825 or something as decimal points. Yeah, so x is a double um, instead of an integer. But if you wanted to turn x into an integer, you would use the function as an integer, which I confused a little earlier. Very similar functions, one letter off. And now if you run if you run the is double function. It still returns. True. Let's see. Let's see if if, if is <laughs> yeah. Let's see if this also returns true. Oh yes. Good call. We have to overwrite. This highlights an important thing about R, which I completely meant to teach you. Uh, just running the as integer function doesn't overwrite x. Um, you have to save over x. And now if we do it, it says x is not a double. But it is an integer. OK. I need to pull up something. So please give me a moment. Okay, so now let's go back to our is max function. Um, so the reason I got into that is because um, we want this to return NA, but we can also have it return NA real, which returns back a real number. We could have it return NA character, which is a null value, but of type character for some reason. Well, let's just have it return NA. Okay, this looks good, so let's run the function. Anyone see where of our... Yeah, our extra good. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Good call. Yes. Nice. Uh, yes. Okay. Let's take a little detour. Okay. So we learned about the assignment operator, um, and we learned about um, the equal sign. But what is double equals? The reason why we're getting it's a little bit out of order is because these are lecture two materials. You guys seem very well versed in the lecture one materials. Um, so while we can do something like x, sorry, x equals five or something. Actually, yeah. If we do x, um, if we use the double equal sign, that's actually a, a logical operator instead of an assignment. So that that is uh, basically where it's a member of functions like le greater than, less than. Um, and to check if two things are equal to each other, you do equals, you know, equals, equals. So if we do two equals equals three, that should be false. And then it returns false. If we, what happens if we do this? Two equals equals two L. 
that is true. Even though um, R probably reads this as a double and this as an integer. So if we do x1, if you look over here from a long time ago, we had x1 equal to what this vector. If we do x1 double equals x2. Um, so this is interesting. Um, for each element, it checks each element of x1 and sees if it equals the corresponding element of x2. If we do x3, it does the same thing that we were looking at before where it repeats it. So when we're writing a function um, that's checking multiple cases, um, if you check one case, if you want to check for the equal to case, you need to do double equals. Okay. So now we have a new function called I'm the real meat. No, I'm the real max. Or I'm just the max. Let's see. Now we just check in some numbers. Get evaluates it. Yay. Nice. Yeah, so this is a good introduction to the concept of loops um, in functions. Yeah, so this is an if-else statement. Um, let's look into some other types of loops that we can use in R. So just like other programming languages, we have four statements. Or, yeah. And um, the way you would set up a for statement, you'd write, you know, use for to initiate it. Um, you'd have a variable, a looping variable, call this i. And then you'd have a range over which it goes through. Okay, so unlike other um, co uh, programming languages, R is not indexed to zero. That means it things start at one um we'll get into that later but th that's also why um we tend to like we tend to use sequences that start with one um, and they end at the number that we're interested in we don't have to do any n minus one stuff so you can write a simple for loop that prints the number of the loop you're in So, we, so what happens in this kind of function is that um, you have a variable i, uh, and it takes on the val it takes on each value in this range that you give it. So in this case, I give it one to ten. Um, this section of the code it tells tells uh, explains what like should happen to that i. So you can do something like printing. You could do something like uh, printing i squared if you wanted to. Um, and so after it executes the code for one value of i, it hits this the end of the for statement. And um, as long as i is not is not outside the range, uh, so it increments i by one, and then it checks whether it's still in the range, and then it keeps executing this code, incrementing i um, by one uh, until until it's no longer, until it's outside the range of this code. Um, but it doesn't have to, so I incremented it by one because, um, because that, that, was, that was the range of numbers I gave it, one, two, three, four, five, up to 10. Um, we can also give it a sequence that maybe skips around. Let's do. So in this case, instead of uh, going through every number, it did all the odd numbers between one and 10 and it printed the squared value. Or pause. 
Any questions so far? Yeah. Uh, yeah yeah uh, you can call so you'd want to write like the sequence function in here you can you can call any function um that's a good question um when you make when you use a function whether it's built in or if it's custom made uh the variables that you pass into the function are given names locally within the function. So that's different from a global variable, which shows up over here and um, and exists outside of the function. So if you notice, let's go back to I'm the real mean. We set up, okay, yeah, let's rerun this. We set up this function with x, y, and z. Um, but if we run this function, um, you'll notice that the variable x, y, and z here don't change, even though you think that they would. So I'm um, the real mean. If I let it evaluate z, it gives me the mean of z, but it didn't change the value of z here. And it didn't change value of x. So these x, this x, y, and z are set up locally. So you can you can run a function. So if you notice the sum and length are functions um, themselves and they are within this custom function. You can set up a function, you can pass it these local inputs um, and it'll evaluate something, but it will only return what you specify it to return. And this is something that you can set to a global variable. Now you set up a new variable called my mean, and it has a set equal to that. Any other questions? Okay. I'm gonna double check that I forgot something from the for one. So um, the functions that we were using, greater than, equal, less than, equal to, um, these are called logical operators. And they uh, also include, one thing that I forgot to mention, the not equals to. So the not equals to is specified by doing an exclamation point and an equal sign. Um, and also gives you an output that is a Boolean, um, is true or false. So Booleans are another data type. Are another data type, just like um, doubles, integers, and characters are. Okay, it is a data type, but I guess it doesn't have an is function. So you can do is x1 not equal to x2, and that does it element-wise, minus x1 greater than x2, 
that should also return false. That's because they're both the uh, they're both the same vector. Let me check if x one is less than x two. And so on. Okay, so one thing that you'll have to learn, you'll um, we'll talk a little bit about in this class are truth tables. Um, have anyone, if, if you heard about truth tables before, um, it's basically just combinations of true and false val val uh, values um, and different logical statements. Let's see. So we can set up um, different variables as booleans. Um, so this can be, you can set A equal to true. You can set B equal to true also. Um, and then you can do other kinds of logical operations with them. So you can do an AND statement. Um, an AND statement uh, basically checks whether both the left side and the right side are true, so the first and second arguments. Um, so in this case, it returns true. If you set one of these equal to false, now this would return false. An or statement is written using this, this vertical line. And that checks whether uh, one of the arguments is, e is equal to true. It doesn't necessarily have to be both. And then the last basic logical operation you have is um, the not. So that is with this exclamation point. And that basically just negates um, the input you give it. So A is true, but if I do this, now it becomes false. So you can combine um, these logical operations in a number of ways. So I could do not A and B. Um, okay. What will this value to? Can someone tell me the way A and B are set up right now? Okay, let's try it. It's equal to it's not it's false. Um maybe if we put parentheses around it, it would evaluate to true. And it does. So this is an important note. Make sure you know what it's applying to. Um, so in this first line, R thinks that this not is only applied to the A. Um, so since A is true, this makes this false. So now it's false and false is false. Um, but if you put wrap the A and B in parentheses, now all of a sudden um, this expression evaluates the false, but it's negated by this operation. So it's true. In the end. So these things can get quite complicated. Um, so it's very important to try to break it down part by part and then um, then evaluate it. You can always just run, you can write the code and run it, but uh, it is useful to be able to understand this to don't make some coding mistakes. Let's see. What do you think this will evaluate to? False. You're false. Yes, and that's correct. Let's do the same thing. That's also false. This this evaluated it true and then it negated. Um and we can do some like truly like long crazy things like you can do a or b and a and b 
throw in some knots in there. Um, and the way you would want to try to understand this kind of statement is work inside out. Um, first, check for parentheses, evaluate what um, one statement is, each statement is within the parentheses, and then maybe rewrite it. So if we try to understand what's going on here, um, you'd start here. Say A and B, sorry, A or B will evaluate to true because one of those at least one is true. Um, look at and, B not. And then you would look at inside this, A and B. This will evaluate to false because um, B is false. And then when you put the negation in there, this evaluates to true. So this statement ends up just being true and true. Any questions? The way a truth table works, um, okay, actually I'll talk about truth tables next time when we get closer to the homework. Okay, let's do a recap of what we've talked about so far. Um, so we've talked about simple objects, simple functions or just simple operations we can do with objects, um, some basic functions um, that could be useful to you. Uh, we talked about the sample function in particular, and we we talked about how to write our own functions. Then we um, talked about different data types, logical operations, and um, some loops, for loops, and if else statements. And we actually even uh, combine these into a nice function. Okay. Um, next, let's look at how, let's look at a custom function and see if we can figure out the meaning behind. Um, So let's say you have a function, and this is what it looks like. It's kind of long, kind of confusing. Um, but let's try to figure out what it's doing. Um, so we can read through it line by line, and then see if we can decode the meaning. Or we can try um, plugging in some values and see. So if we put in, um, can someone give me a number to try? Make it like less than 20. 17, okay. Uh, that's not 17. Okay, it returns true. We don't really know why, right? Um, any other numbers? You can put in 20 in there. But it's false. Okay, let's see. Give me another odd number then. 11. True. Let's do another one. Ooh, false. What could this be? Prime numbers? Okay, let's see. We'll we'll just test a few prime numbers and then then see. We could try thirteen. Thirteen is true. We could try twenty nine. True. I don't know too many large primes. Five, five. Okay, good. Oh, two, three. Yeah, let's try those. I'll just do this. False. False. Two is prime. Okay, so maybe all prime numbers after two, maybe. 
Okay, let's see if we can try to decode what this function is doing by looking at the line by line. Okay, so if, if the value is less than two, it returns false. Okay, so if I put in one and zero, it should give me false. Um, but then uh, if it makes it past this point in the code, then for every, okay, so this checked whether the value is less than two and then return false. Um, so as soon as you hit the return code, it jumps out of the function. So any number that's less than two isn't going to make it to this part of the function. So then we look through the for loop, uh, the for statement. Um, so for every n in this sequence, this is kind of strange, right? So we look at the number we're given, we go less than that number, one less than that number, and then we check every number, two, three, et cetera, until one less than that number. Oh, if x, sorry, I can't read this number. Oh, if x percent percent n is equal to zero, then return false. Okay, so this is another mathematical operator um, that we didn't talk about. Let's So this um, percent percent sign gives you the modulus or the remainder um, of the operation when you take the first number divided by the second number. So if you do six divided by five, um, it's one with a remainder of one. If you do six divided by three, the remainder is zero because three is a factor of six. Wait, okay, let's do something like um, nine modulus. Five. So um, if you do nine modulus five, uh, the remainder of nine divided by five is equal to four. Um, so why do you think we're using modulus here in this function? So if we're saying that the modulus is equal to zero, then return false. Yes, exactly. Um, do you think this is a well-written function? Do you think, do you see any problems with it? You know, it, it actually should return, it should return two, I think, if, Oh no, never mind. Um, maybe it would be better if for two it returned true because two is a prime number. Um, well, another problem that I can see is that when the number gets really big, it's gonna take a long time. So we can put in something like a hundred and see how long it'll take. Okay, let's add a few more zeros in. Oh, wow. Hey, this is already bigger than the code I was doing. Okay, there we go. Oh, that's true. That's true. I have to give it a bad num a big number. That is also odd. Yeah, so this is taking a long time, right? And that's bad from your security data analysis because you don't you don't want to be spending this much time for each row maybe in your analysis. So um, can anyone think of a way we can make this function faster? For example, do we really need to check every number um, less than the number we give it? Is there some, any shortcut we can take? Duncan, I see you shaking your head. Half of the numbers? Yes, but um, I'm gonna modify that a little bit to the square root um, of the number. 
Um, if you remember the square root, if you take a number, take its square root. So that number, that square root times itself will give you back the number, right? So um, we can, instead of checking all those numbers, we can just check um, to the square root of the number. So let's call this function is prime, but then let's write a better function, okay? Is prime better? So we can just if we can bring in this part of the function. We don't need to change anything about that. Um, then um, I guess we can copy over the second part of the function too, but um, instead of making it x minus 1, we can do the square root of x, which we can write like this. Um, and since this will probably give us some strange number, we can take the floor of it. So this is the closest integer less than um, the value that this this will return. And then we can write return. So let's uh, Oh, let me also take this moment to save this file. Always remember to save your work. Very important. Okay, so let's try to see if the function that we wrote is uh, faster than is much faster than um, the previous function. So one thing that we can look, the function that we can use to check the time of that's on our computer is this this time. Okay. This this time function is some time. Um, and basically that saves um, the time into this variable called start. What happened here? Oh. Uh, hello. You made it? Okay. Cool. Cool. Okay. It's hard to see from this angle. Um, didn't work okay, I'm going to restart. Yeah, something is off about my brackets, but I will keep on this. quite execute. Like it, it didn't, um, so this didn't save as a function over here. So I mean, something is wrong. Wait,
Okay, we'll go into this next class time. So I have, um, so when I run this function, start um, and assign to the system time, it saves the time that when I ran it um, in, in the global environment. Um, so let's test, um, yeah, let's test is prime for this number and see how long this function takes. So once you save the time right before the function is run, run the function and then print the time after it's finished um, minus the start time. So I'll highlight the section of code and run it. It takes a long time. And it's not just because my computer is slow. Um, it's because the function is also slow. <laughs> so we can also um, check the running time of the better function we wrote and try that next. Oh, it took 45 seconds. When I ran this yesterday, it took 20 seconds, actually. So um, it's pretty bad. OK, so we have this other function called is prime better. And let's see how long that takes. So we did the same chunk of code, but uh, switched out the function we're using. And let's run this. Oh, wow. OK, that took less than a second. <laughs> So please, you should try to optimize your code um, as much as you can um, to keep to keep um, your runtime kind of lower. So uh, the if you've ever seen like big O notation in coding, that's kind of what this concept is illustrating. Like the first function is like a completely order of magnitude like longer than the second function that we wrote. Okay, I think we're at a good stopping point for today. Um, let's take some more questions. Um, if not, we can wrap up for the day. Um, for those of you who came in late, uh, I I will I will stop my share actually. Uh, for those of you.